I think Wally Fry is coming up. So Wally is uh, the founder of Fry's. Um, started the business 25 years ago in the kitchen at home. It's a very inspiring story. He was an avid meat eater. I managed to change him. Um, and uh, it's just an incredible story of how Fry's came to be and how we now end up on the supermarket shelves all over the world. So I'm going to hand over to Wally. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you all doing? You're bored of listening to talking, I bet. Um, so, I'm very honored to be here, of course, and uh, big kudos to Mark and his team for putting together such a fantastic um, organized vegan day. Um, it's quite remarkable how many people have gone through the gates We've got a stand out there in the other, um, in the other facility, and uh, the people are queuing at every stand. There's such a lot of interest. It's fantastic. It's a fantastic day for me because I started this journey of mine for, of vegetarianism, essentially, about 27 years ago. And uh, when I come to an event like this, it's almost like a dream come true where I see so many like-minded people gathering together. It's just absolutely awesome. So people often ask me to tell this story because it's a story of uh, entrepreneurial success, and it's uh, a fairly unlikely story. You'll find as I weave my way through the story how it's almost as if... Um, the cosmos inspired against, they, were, they conspired against me to uh, use me almost as a conduit to get something else going in my life and in other people's lives. So I hope you uh, can bear with me while I uh, weave this tangled web with you. The Vedas and the Upanishads are some of the oldest and most authentic scripts of all time. Now, the Vedas were written about 6,000 to 7,000 years ago, mostly in India. They were written by great sages, and they encapsulate the basic philosophies of truth, of how things really are, way above our sometimes misguided belief systems that come to us through society and forces and pressures of peer groups. Another great sage, much younger than the Upanishads, by the name of Jesus Christ, said to his followers one day, the kingdom of heaven is within you. It's not some far-flung destination without a GPS coordinate. The Vedas say that with birth comes a separation from our real essence, our real self. In fact, this is when the ego is born, which is something separate from our real selves. Our five senses, that is hearing, smelling, tasting, and that's a big one we want to talk about today, tasting, and touch, feeling, feeling of touch, um, and seeing, of course. These five sensations are available to us when we get born. And as we grow, when we see, touch, feel, smell, or taste, our desire levels go up. So we desire something that we see or taste. We desire it, and with that, the mind is born and, of course, the ego. This then, with us, we take up beliefs and self-satisfying activities which generally move us away from the truth. They move us from a possible position of we, us, and ours to an essential opposite of I, me, and mine. They also tell of the place where humans need to aim for in our lives on earth, we need to move back 
to the we, ours, and us place. They also tell us that when and if we reach this point where we move past just saying me or I, and we move to the place of just me and my family, then to the place of just me, my family, and my community, and then just to the place of just me and my family, my community, my tribe, my nation, then to all humanity. And then onwards, if we can reach that, fantastic, to all manifested living things as an extension of oneself. A peasant Zulu lady once said to me in response to a question that I posed, after I saw her rush onto a busy freeway, Zulu, by the way, is a tribe of people in Africa where I come from. And actually, it was my first language, interestingly enough, so English I learned second. And the Zulu lady said to me, after I posed a question, she rushed onto a busy freeway, picked up a rhinoceros beetle, and delivered it safely to the side of the freeway to save it from certain death of motor car wheels. And I asked her why she risked her life for this beetle. And she said to me in Zulu, how? Sounds nice, doesn't it? <laughs> she said to me basically, sir, with respect, do you not know that the breath of life is shared by all living creatures? This was a peasant woman with maybe $10 to her name living in a mud and straw hut on subsistence farming outcomes and she points the way to us all. The basic difference between a mosquito, folks, and a Boeing is that the mosquito, they both fly, I concede, they both can fly. But the difference between the Boeing and the mosquito is the mosquito is alive, the Boeing is dead. You see, I grew up as a farmer's son, and I was working the lands and the livestock, and I had the belief system that all animals and the soil were units of currency to be traded, used, and destroyed to realize their monetary value. So it comes as no surprise then that when I left home, it was perfectly okay for me to become a trader in goats and other livestock. I was really just buying the stock from farmers in remote locations and the outback type places and keeping them on my acreage thousands of kilometers away and selling them to individuals for no other basic purpose than slaughter. I was also a bit of a water ski bum at that time, and I was skiing for the national team, and you know what, I needed money to fuel my boat, so this was a good way to get currency, you know, to feed the sport and fame and the ego. I never knew then how the universe would conspire to bring me to the place where I find myself today. So here enters the first what I call divine intervention. You see, there was this beautiful, caring young girl who was attracted to me. And God will only know why. Here I was, I was a guy going into these goat trucks and pulling them out by the back legs. The goats were urinating on me, they were pooing on me, and I literally had the smell of goat's poo about four millimeters deep into my skin. And yet, she was attracted to me somehow. I lived in a house not, not dissimilar to this one. And um, I had none of the modern conveniences. I had no tap water, running tap water. In fact, I had to fetch my water from a river about two kilometers away in a 25-liter drum. And uh, I would carry it back up to my shack up a scramble steep hillside. Yet somehow, we were attracted to each other. By the way, that 25 liter would have to last me two days. Somehow we were attracted to each other. So the first time we ever went out to a restaurant for dinner, I also discovered another thing for the first time in my life. My wife, or my now wife, Debbie, my girlfriend then, announces to me that she's a vegetarian. 
I'm saying, what the hell is that? I mean, who does stuff like that? Yet soon, she started to work on my consciousness regarding my work, and these animals would arrive in their triple-decker trucks to be offloaded, and sometimes the ewes, that is the lady goats, would have given birth to kids. That would be on a very long, torturous trip all the way from Namibia, thousands of kilometers away. Debbie would scoop up these kids, and she would take them off to care for them. And she would immediately give them names, because, you know, humans don't think. The ones that eat meat won't eat the animals with names, funnily enough. So she would give them names, and uh, she therefore, I think, saved them from the grisly fate of the dinner plates of my farmhands. Well, Debbie and I got married, and we had our first child. It was a baby girl, and we called her Tammy. We've just had Tammy on the stage now. She's not such a baby girl anymore. And once again, the, inter the divine was intervening in my life. Like her mom, without any prompting, um, she was a born vegetarian. Now, people say to me, there tends to be no such thing as born vegetarians. And I say right back to them, you don't know what you're talking about. I've first-hand experience of it. There are such people. In fact, I think there's a lot more children that are born vegetarian. They just, we just never know about them because their parents tell them they're wrong. They need to eat their meat, which is what I was doing to Tammy, by the way, 30-something years ago. And now there were two voices in my life, softening my ego, making me think beyond my belief system, so much so that I decided to quit the livestock business. You know, Tammy, at three years old, would question me about things that I'd never questioned myself about. So my wife would never, well, Debbie, my wife would never ever uh, question my belief system. But Tammy would hit me straight between the eyes. And she'd say to me, what am I eating here? And I'd tell her, well, it's a drumstick. And she'd say, no, but I know that I play drums with the drumsticks. This is not a drumstick, Daddy. What, what, what am I eating here? And I'd say to her, well, I had to tell the truth. I'd say, well, it's, it's a chicken's leg. I'd be eating the other leg. I'd be eating the other one, enjoying it. And she'd say, well, was this a real live chicken walking around? And I would say, yes. She'd say, well, why did they kill it? I said, well, that's what people do. They kill them, and then they, they eat them. And like... With every question, I even, get, I even get goosies right now thinking about it. With every question, she attacked my, the very heart of my belief system. And I must tell her one story about one day we were sitting in a restaurant. And uh, there was a beautiful, there, were, there was a, a, a trophy of an antelope on the wall. It was beautiful to me then. It was a water buck, which is an African antelope. Beautiful horns. It was up on the wall. And I noticed that she wasn't listening to us when we were eating. She was, sta she was sitting and staring at this trophy on the wall. And eventually she said to me, Daddy, what is that? And I said, it's a water buck. And she said, but it's not. So I said, yes, it is a water buck. I'm your dad. I know better. It's a water buck. She said, but it's not. So I said, but why are you saying that? I'm telling you it's a water buck. She said, but I've been watching it for a long time and it hasn't blinked. So I said, well, really the thing is it's not a live water buck. It's like a, I mean, what can I say to this child? It's a, it's a dead one. So she said to me, well, why did the guy, why is it there? So I said, well, there was a guy, he was this hunter guy, and he went out and he, um, and so now I'm choosing my words carefully. This is more difficult than giving a child sex education. And I'm saying, well, then he went out and he, he, he shot it. He shot, he shot it. And then he liked it so much that he put it up on the wall. He thought it would be beautiful there. She said, but... If he liked it so much, why did he kill it? And in any case, it can never be beautiful when it's dead. She said this to me when she was three and a half. 
So here I am eating my steak and I'm listening to the story. A friend of mine said, you should have lied to her. You should have told her that this water buck was jumping through from the kitchen to the dining room and it went halfway through the wall and the half of its body was still in the back, kicking like this. It was very much alive. It was just a joke, of course, but I couldn't tell her a lie like that. And um, so the powerful thing that happened. Anyway, as a result of these and many other experiences, I quit the livestock business. And when I was offered a position in my father-in-law's company as a learner builder, I grabbed it with both hands. Soon he taught me enough to enable Debbie and I to venture out into our, on our own with our own construction company, which turned from house building to serious contracting. Shopping centers, factories, apartment blocks were our stock work. We were doing well. One day, I was offered a contract to construct a modern industrial piggery. A farmer with a pig farm where pigs roam free in pastures decided that he would be much more profitable, make much more money, if he constructed this piggery. It's called a 4,000 sow unit. That means they have 4,000 breeding sows, and these factory animals, they produce piglets, which eventually become bacon. So I didn't think about all of that. I thought about the contract. I built this complex structure and completed it, really completed it with much pride and satisfaction, and on time, and properly built way out in the outback with the challenges that that presents. Once again, folks, there was to be a moment, a changing moment where the divine coincidence would bring about an epiphany that would change everything forever in my life. I went back to snag this job, that is to fix the things that weren't right, when it was fully functional. And for the first time, the realization of where my bacon came from hit me like a sledgehammer. I was shocked at the structure I had built, an Auschwitz, not a farm. I hurriedly completed my snags and I went back home to announce to my family that I was becoming a vegetarian today, on that day. <clears throat> a shock, no doubt, to many, but a happy moment for my girls. I had three daughters. Very quickly it became apparent to me that I would never be able to sustain broccoli, spinach, and pasta. Without the protein and the taste of something savory on my plate, I realized I would fail. I've got a weak willpower. So I decided I would close my construction company, which was quite successful, and uh, I would focus on developing a meat replacement, which would be high in protein, from plant proteins, savory in taste, and a meal center within itself. So I set up my home style test kitchen and I started every day to mix ingredients together. I would heat them, spin them, cool them, freeze them, heat them again, until I gained an intimate knowledge of how food ingredients worked. Soy, wheat, maize, potatoes, herbs, spices, chickpeas, etc., all have wonderful functionalities and nutritional benefits. And I learned these from being a builder mixing concrete, I was mixing food ingredients, just a small shift. So when you take time to work with things and you're passionate, you learn a lot. At some points in time, I was challenging food scientists about their beliefs about how certain ingredients would behave under certain conditions in the kitchen. With this incredible enthusiasm, it could not help but rub off on the family, which was growing by this stage, and they all chipped in and they helped. I decided then and there that if I was to feed these products to myself and my family, I had to ensure only the best quality of vegan ingredients could be sourced. And to be sure not to have any preservatives, genetically modified ingredients at all. By the way, this was 30 years ago, and GM-free let alone vegetarianism, were just not out there yet. I soon realized these sausages that I was painstakingly made by hand with a sausage churn, and I was literally measuring them out 130 millimeters at a time, tying them off with a piece of string until I had a little string of sausages, dumping them into hot water into a stainless steel pot, 
and then heating them on a twin plate burner and cooking them and tasting them. And they were made from these ingredients that had never before been mixed together in this way by people in their kitchens with just a Kenwood Chef blender. I realized that I was truly onto something that could change the world. By offering a solution, an easy way for people to stop consuming the flesh of slaughtered animals and sustain it indefinitely. I think we've seen here today enough times where people become vegetarians, but 84% of them roughly revert back to meat eating. There's a simple reason for that. The taste. The taste drives people back over and over again. They can't resist the smell of bacon. Eventually, if you've been a vegan long enough, bacon smells awful, but it smells good when you're just recently a vegan, trust me. So, with the free help of a vegetarian marketing guru, I decided to offer the products to the supermarkets and just go mainstream right from the get-go. I needed everywhere in the world to have the opportunity I had afforded myself to become a successful vegetarian. And I figured for that, for that to happen, I would be only happy when every kilogram I produced and others consumed, it would be one kilogram less of meat equivalents consumed. So I presented in a very unusual way to the buyer of a retail chain in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, where this history really started. I was immediately successful in that he listed the range, and he said to me, what would I call it? I hadn't even given it a name yet. I just gave him a whole platters of these products. I had two sausages, one burger, and a hot dog sausage that I'd cut up into pieces and the whole head office of the supermarket chain had come through to taste them, and they loved them. So he said, yes, we'll do this thing, but what will you call it? Have you got a name? And I said, no, actually don't. So, so he said, well, you need to have a name. So I said, well, I'll call it Fries. I just blurted that out. I said, it's my family name, so I'll call it Fries. He said, that's good enough. I think that's a good one. And so he agreed with me with everything I said, and, I, and then he said to me, when can you supply? So I, I, I started making every white lie in the book um, about how busy I was supplying all the other shops and that I would never be able to supply him. I needed four months before I could get an order to his 40 supermarkets. He accepted my lies, and uh, I left his office knowing that with a Kenwood chef and a Thrupp's cappuccino machine for steam and a Stanley knife, I would never be able to cope with 40 supermarket stores. Once again, Providence stepped in, and the very next day I was made by a friend came around to see me, and I told him that I'd had a, got a listing at a supermarket chain. And uh, he made me aware of a closing down auction sale of a food factory which was happening on that very day. So I got in my car and I went down there and I looked at these machines. And folks, I promise you, I didn't know what one of them was called and what one of them did. But I bought all of them. So I just bought them. I put them on a truck, a very, very big truck loaded on by crane, big 18-wheeler, and we took it up to my construction shed and we offloaded them. And I stood there and I looked at them and I thought to myself, okay, so what the hell do we do now? Another providence happened where the following day I was standing there wondering what to do and opening the machines and looking at them. And uh, somebody walked into my shed and said, excuse me. I said, yeah, how can I help you? He said, my name is Mr. Zulu. He was an old Zulu man, gray beard. And he said, I'm looking for a job. So I said, um, well, I haven't got a job for you unless you can run all of these machines here. If you know how to use these machines, you've got a job. And he said, as it happens, this is what I've been doing all my life, is running these machines. So I said, okay, you're on, because I don't know what to do. So he literally did. He taught us uh, what to do, and we set these machines up in some format of a little factory. You know, it was a tall order. I needed to honor this order, 
that are being given and packaging still had to be designed. We were designing packaging with a texta on cardboard. Uh, the machinery had to be commissioned, freezers had to be built, all totally unfamiliar territory, and we did it. And suddenly, just like a miracle, I suppose, this unique food which I developed was finding its way into trucks to the people of South Africa. Look, the rest is really history, because from those very rudimentary beginnings when we were making 50 kilograms a day, I mean, I remember phoning our distribution agents and saying, how many packets have you sold today? He'd say, two. I'd say, oh, we've got to make it three, just three packets today, please. And uh, so from those rudimentary beginnings, we now supply our foods to around 27 countries in the world. <clears throat> With over 50 products developed in exactly the same way in our kitchen for our own personal consumption, and then cleverly transported from the kitchen in that particular exact way and replicated with more bigger giant machines that do exactly the same thing. And often these machines have to be purpose-built for our, for our factory. The Fryers brand is present in over 5,000 supermarkets around the world today. It's offering the same essential solution with a staggering product range of around 50 variants to people who decide to become vegan or vegetarian and by making it easy for them to stay vegan. We place our ethics above profits at all times. In fact, we measure our success every month, every year. When others are looking at their profitability, we're measuring our success in dollars and cents of profit, not in dollars and cents of profit, but by the number of animals we saved every time a fryer's product is consumed instead of a meat equivalent. In 2015, these numbers are quite staggering. This is, this is by the way, just for 2015. It's not an accumulative figure. I, I don't know how many, if we accumulated it over the 25 years, I don't know how many it would come to, but this was for 2015. It's about 15 million chickens, 15,000 cows, and about 75,000 pigs. Thank you. We really get stoked by those figures in our office. And I must tell you, my whole marketing department uh, are all vegans. They, in fact, actually just drive me mad like all vegans tend to do. And um, this is the stuff of their dreams, uh, the people in our marketing office. Recently, we have developed a range specifically for the Aussie market, which is rich in superfoods that we are all coming to love to add to our diets like quinoa, chia, flax, moringa, etc. Several of them are gluten-free, and so the range is truly positioned to become an Aussie legend for vegans. By the way, our whole family, I don't think I said this, I moved my whole family over to Australia about four years ago, so we all live in Australia now and we, um, we love it very much. We are even venturing now into many, <coughs> into many exciting new products which were outside of our radar. Some of these have been launched here at the World Vegan Day, and I don't know how many of you have been over in the tent there and uh, seen our vegan ice cream range, which is made in an artisan factory in South Africa and was developed with love and care for excellence and a bit of decadence in our otherwise mostly savory range of products. By my other vegetarian daughter, who does, not, who, who does not do the marketing and the talking like we do. She's the worker. And um, she developed these products as she has many other exciting new products that you fries, uh, loyal fries people are enjoying at the moment. So it is truly a family organization. We still choose our ingredients very carefully, ensuring that the highest quality of product at all time uh, reaches our consumer. Products that we eat ourselves each and every day and products that our children eat every day. Never will our values be compromised. Fries will never compromise on its highest of vegan standards. Because, of, because our business shares many of the tenets of social enterprise, we work with many of the non-profit organizations and we support them wherever possible and will continue to do so. 
I spoke to Peter Hampstead from a Sea Shepherd, and we reminisced about the first packets of fries that I drove from Durban to Cape Town, a thousand kilometers, to deliver his, to his ship, which was impounded at the Durban docks because they considered the ship unsafe to go to sea, and they'd run out of gas. So I went down there and I took them vegetarian foods to eat on the ship, and we formed a relationship way back then. I reminded him that he was a young guy with a ponytail down, to his, down somewhere down his back here, and uh, we reminisced about that. So as I said, today's Fry Family Foods is still run and operated by the family, and our test kitchen is now firmly in the hands of my grandchildren. They're the ones that proof test all of our products. So I find myself here telling you all a story that I hope in some way will inspire you to look uh, into your own lives and move beyond your status quo and get out there and make the world a happier, better place. You know, Rome was not built in a day. We cannot convince 8 billion people to become vegans in one day either. But with joint effort and solutions and commitment, this beautiful dream can be achieved. So once again, I'm really honored to be able to speak here today, and I'm really honored that you took the time to listen to the story. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope in some way it was inspiring, and I wish you all a good afternoon. Thank you. A few months ago, I was on a speaking tour of Africa, giving speeches at various universities, and uh, Wally showed up and decided to provide all the catering for all the events with the fries, far fries foods, it was absolutely fantastic. And when I spoke at the university in Durban, uh, we went down to Wally's factory, and he was going to give us a factory tour. Now, you know I'm a merchant banker, so I've walked through 10,000 factories in my career. Walking through his factory, and hope I won't embarrass him by telling him this, was nothing short of an extraordinary experience for me. It was like walking into Microsoft or walking into Google. It was absolutely spotless. Um, we had to wear plastic overalls over our shoes, over our, on our heads, on our hands. It was the most amazing sense of cleanliness. And I complimented him on it. And you know what Wally did? He spat on his hands, got on his knees, rubbed his hands on, his, on the floor, and then licked his hands. So I want to, Wally hasn't said it, and he's pretty slack of him, really. Um, I really want the fry food to become the default food here in Australia for vegans. So if you guys have got any time at all, please walk into your supermarkets and say, we'd like to try some fries foods. Why haven't you got it on your shelves? I will speak to the manager or write to the CEO because we really, uh, retailers respond to the market and you are the market. And this is a, an easy form of activism to really put fries on the map here in Australia. So I'd really like you to um, think about doing that seriously, and please do it tomorrow. And in the meantime, thank Wally very much for all he's done. Thanks. Thank you so much. I think it goes without saying that every time Phil speaks, he, uh, he, I actually get a little bit emotional and I get a bit te teary because of the truth that he speaks. And uh, I think I've listened to Phil speaking about maybe, I don't know, maybe 20 times now, but I never miss it because it just reminds me of the truth every time. Thank you for what you said, Phil. Thank you. Have you stopped making the pies? Okay, the, the question is, have you stopped making the pies? Because uh, they're, they're no longer on the, in coals uh, like they used to be. Well, what, what's the answer? Uh, so the answer is no, we haven't stopped making them. Willie's stopped taking them. So, um, yeah, so, so a lot of, like I said, there are 50 products in our range, about 53, I think. So um, the truth is that we're governed by the supermarkets. We can't make the rules for them. So when they decide to move on, uh, we have to move with them or we out. So they actually brought about the change now that we've recently made. They said you need to innovate. We need new products. We're taking the old ones off. Unless you innovate, you're out. So we innovated five new products, um, you know, that, that are on the shelves now, yeah. Uh, are all of your products manufactured in South Africa? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, by and large they are. 
Um, so we do all the research work here, and then we uh, have them made in South Africa. We would love to have them made over here, but it's, it's a very big factory now. It's, we employ about 500 people, and uh, we moved here as, as a family, um, but in order to move that size of operation over here is going to be extremely difficult. But what we would intend to do is that we've, if we invent or develop a product which is not sharing similar plant, in other words, it's a standalone something, then we would like to start producing it here. But while the plant is there, it's going to be very difficult to move it over. But that would be our intention. Um, so if the supermarkets will only allow you to sell a very narrow range of your products, but uh, vegans would like to be able to buy a much wider range of your products, is it, is it possible to sell stuff to people direct or so, use smaller stores to, to offer us a wider range? Yeah. So one of the things that we learned when we came here was that Australia is a very different country in the, when it comes to the, the retail space. I mean, we've got a fairly good knowledge of how, the, how retail works in the world. And um, we're trading in 27 countries, so we've got a pretty good idea of how things work. Uh, but Australia is nothing like anywhere else. So we're dominated by two retail chains here, and we have to do what they ask us to do. Now, uh, I don't hate them for that. They are what they are, and they have the power. And if they ask you to jump, you just ask how high, really, if you want to have your products on the shelf there. You need to, you need to conform to their you know, to their game, you have to march to their tune. So that doesn't worry me and we do it. But the one thing that I couldn't determine was like, you know, I'll give you 20 products. Because on that same piece of sh supermarket shelf, I think their turnover, for example, of frozen chicken could be 10, 15 times what they'll sell to the vegans. So they're governed by the economics of their shareholders' demands. And you know, one has to, I suppose, understand that uh, because that's what they're driven by. Uh, you know, so, but what we have realized is that there are tons and tons, hundreds of independent, active, you know, trading retail outlets. You know, we've, we've come to realize that they're a force to be reckoned with in the retail trade. And, and to that end, we've chosen a distributor who distributes only vegan products to the IGAs and the you know, the Thomas Ducks and the Harris Farms and so on and so forth. And uh, he'll be taking that on from January. So hopefully, pretty soon, you'll be able to see a wider range on the, what we call the independence shelves. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm honored. Thank you.